Um, I'll be talking about pollinators and native companion plants, specifically how to add biodiversity to your garden with native plants, while at the same time, you know, enjoying much more juicier fruits and more and better vegetables uh, because you have the right pollinators in your garden. Now, flowering plants, basics, everybody knows this, plants don't flower because they look pretty to us. They plant uh, plants flower because they uh, want to have sex. They want to transfer pollen from the male anther of a flower to the female stigma. Now, this can happen through a variety of different ways, wind and water and insects and birds and uh, mammals. But right, a vast majority of pollination happens through insects, um, I think over 80%. And, and, and really, the answer is not far to seek, right? So if you think about a pin-sized uh, male anther trying to uh, you know, send microscopic pollen to another pin-sized female stigma, which might be miles away, throwing your pollen into the wind and hoping the capricious wind is going to carry it right to that um, stigma, uh, not, not going to happen that easily, right? On the other hand, bees, butterflies, beetles, uh, mammals, whatever, these are extremely smart and they carry that pollen with pinpoint precision. Um, and so the, the, the plant has to expend fewer resources uh, while uh, essentially uh, in the process of pollination. Now, it's kind of very weird when you think about it that, you know, um, when a male and a female of a species want to have sex, they really need this other species intermediary in order to do it. Um, so yeah, it's an innovation and it's an extremely successful innovation. And it's a recent uh, innovation, evolutionarily speaking. When you look at evolution, when you look at the history of life, that's, I don't know, three and a half billion years old on this planet. Um, you don't. You you have to wait until almost 140 million years ago. That is the Cretaceous. So well after the Jurassic, when the dinosaurs existed, right? In the Cretaceous is when you get flowering plants really taking over the face of the earth. And um, the, the, when you look at the, rec the when you look at the uh, paleontolo paleontological record, you also find a simultaneous explosion in butterflies and bees and wasps and beetles and anything else that pollinates. So this coevolution turns out to be this plot by flowering plants and insects to take over the world and actually, you know, it succeeds. And that's why we enjoy all these beautiful apples and pears and tomatoes and whatever else, right? So, so, this, so, so it's important to understand this for your garden because coevolution is a specific relationship, right? So a specific flower with a specific size, shape, color, and structure is engineered to allow a certain size and dimension of uh, insect to come in and pollinate. And not only that, because this relationship of co-evolution not only provides nectar, right? It also very often provides habitat, and then it also provides a host relationship. So you're all familiar with um, let us say monarch butterflies that lay eggs only on milkweed plants and you know hatch their young, which eat milkweed leaves in order to grow big. Uh, well, there are similar relationships all over the plant kingdom, and you'll find specific interactions between um, specific bees or wasps or butterflies and plants. So this relationship, right, of coevolution uh, attracts certain kinds of pollinators to certain kinds of plants. And that is something you need to be able to use in your garden because all the plants that you have in your garden, the tomatoes and the peppers and the eggplant, they had wild relatives, wild ancestors, right? They had wild ancestors who depended on a specific kind of pollinators. For example, tomatoes. Now, tomatoes, as many of us know, can self-pollinate. But um, scientists studying this have basically observed that if bumblebees pollinate your tomato plants, then you get far more fruit, meaning flowers much more consistently turn into fruit. And not only that, the size and the shape of the fruit and the juiciness and the content of the fruit actually improves by virtue of the fact that they were pollinated by bumblebees and not self-pollinated, right? Um, similar things with peppers, eggplants, green beans, squashes, cucumbers, some of them self-pollinate, some of them don't. But in any case, insect pollination 
does result in much better yield and much better quality of yield as well. Uh, and so you do want to attract the right sized insects into your yard in order to pollinate the right, um, uh, right vegetable or fruit. And, and, and so, you know, the best way to attract these insects is, you know, put in native perennial wildflowers into your garden, right? Either in the border or in a nearby meadow or whatever it is. So you're attracting all these, uh, the right butterflies or a very diverse set of butterflies, bees, moths, wasps, etc., in so that while they are there, they can go over to your vegetable plant and pollinate that as well. Um, so you're bringing pollinators to your garden, which, you know, which, which are attracted by the nectar pollen as well as host plants. And because you're putting perennial plants in, the perennial wildflowers in, you don't need to buy that plant year after year and plant. You just put it in once and you enjoy it for many years to come. Um, these are drought tolerant, deep rooted plants that are hardy and don't need fertilizer and pesticides. So easy maintenance, you need to weed, but you don't really need to fertilize or put, on, put pesticides on them. And they additionally provide other ecosystem services, depending on the plant you're putting in. It may have mycorrhizal fung fungal networks. It may fix nitrogen uh, as well as attract pest predators, which would help get rid of aphids and other things, other uh, creatures that are uh, trying to eat your uh, vegetables. And so while you're doing all of this, you can of course feel good about your contribution to biodiversity and uh, fighting climate change as well. So why not? <laughs> Sounds like a win-win all around, right? Um, so, so the question is, okay, oh, well, you know, what exact, what native plants do I need to put in? Now, this is an area where I, I don't think there are ready resources available, which are, uh, which kind of like, you know, um, can, I can point you to, but basically, you know, uh, what I can give you is an exemplar. We have a garden that B and I and many others here from Planter Row will be working on at the Helen Keller Institute. Uh, in Port Washington. And um, at, in that garden where we grow vegetables, we are gonna be planting a mix of uh, wild uh, pollinators, uh, uh, you know, native pollinators this season. And this is what we picked, right? And, and, and what we are, the strategy we used is basically saying, hey, first of all, you need to cover different seasons because we want bees to there in early spring, we want it in late spring, we want it in summer, we want it in late summer, and we want a different a mix of bees and we want a different mix of colors because at the end of the day, we want it to look pretty as well. So we picked golden Alexanders and foxglove beard stung, uh, which bring in small, me, uh, small to medium sized bees in spring. Um, and this is sort of, uh, will help you with your strawberries and blackberries and raspberries as well. Uh, wild geranium, which is a beautiful flowering plant, geranium maculatum, uh, brings in medium large bees uh, in spring. Um, again, uh, help you with your blueberries and apples. Then there is uh, Asclepias tuberosa, the butterfly milkweed, common milkweed, wild bergamot. These are all summer flowering um, uh, plants, which will bring um, medium large bees, including especially bumblebees that, you know, uh, are extremely effective with a lot, wide variety of um, uh, vegetables, including green beans, squashes, cucumbers, okra, and so on. Uh, and then wild blue indigo, uh, which is Baptisia australis, as well as wild bergamot, uh, which I'm repeating here, um, but they are also flower in the mid to late spring and summer um, to help with tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. So really the strategy here is bring in a lot of different kinds of bees, um, bring them in at different times of the year and put in a lot of colors, right? And make sure the plants have different sizes. So um, that's kind of what we have done here. Um, and, and, you know, you can definitely do your research. And if your question is, where can I get these plants? Then uh, the answer for you is the Rewild uh, Spring Sale, which is uh, going online very shortly. Um, so March 15th, we'll be going accepting pre-orders from members. Now, uh, membership is $50. Uh, you'll be helping a good cause and you'll be getting a 20% discount on plants you buy. A plus you get an exclusive week to get your hands on uh, some hard to find plants. Um, so that's kind of members only that first week. And then we open it up to the general public uh, starting March 22nd. And then the plants will arrive, right? Um, 
uh, around Mother's Day and you can pick that up from Port Washington or from Lake Grove. So head on over to uh, www.revilelongisland.org for more information about this uh, plant sale. Uh, the second thing, um, we have a sustainable garden tour coming this summer. Uh, we are gonna be demonstrating gardens that are beautiful, biodiverse and sustainable, right? Um, so they'll feature native plants together with uh, organic fruits and vegetables, water conservation, recycling, you know, soil regeneration, composting. I mean, just all kinds of good habits for you to build a beautiful garden that has a low carbon footprint and brings in all these beautiful, beautiful bees, buds, you know, butterflies to your uh, yard. Um, so, you know, if you have a garden uh, like that, please showcase your garden, uh, you know, just reach out to us and let us know that you have something and uh, we'd be you know, glad to select from um, whoever submits. And then uh, you know, if, if, if you, on the other hand, you have some time and you want us to help with the logistics and planning, um, please reach out and volunteer as well. So that's the sustainable garden tour. And if you want any more resources, right? Um, or, or you want to, you're curious about our organization, Rewild Long Island, please head on over to rewildlongisland.org. We have a resources page, which includes a lot of great blog articles of people who have tried out many of these ideas, reporting on both their success and failures. There are links to web pages uh, which have compendia of wildflowers, plants, um, as well as a lot of other resources. So you can definitely um, go there and uh, learn more and, uh, and join us, right? And join us. We are very interested in new members, we are interested in volunteers, we are interested in anybody that wants to put their hand in the dirt and grow beautiful stuff. Thank you and uh, happy gardening. <laughs>